All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Michael Moreland. I am a law professor at Villanova University outside of Philadelphia. And I will uh, say a few brief words of welcome. First, an announcement. Uh, I'm sure you've heard it a few times already, perhaps, about CLE credit. Uh, to get credit, you must sign in and out once per day using the QR codes uh, uh, when you come and when you leave during the day. Uh, secondly, uh, we want to make a quick announcement about our practice groups. Uh, the practice groups are the sponsors of this uh, special panel. Uh, I'm the incoming chair of the Religious Liberties Practice Group, but we have other practice groups in a whole range of areas. If you're interested in joining their work, uh, you can look at the web page and talk to me or a uh, member of the Federal Society staff. Finally, uh, it's my honor to turn things over to the moderator of this distinguished panel, uh, my friend and a friend of many of ours, Professor Robert P. George. Professor George is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program at Princeton University. He is a permanent scholar in the fields of constitutional interpretation, civil liberties, natural law theory, and legal, moral, and political philosophy. Professor George has served as Chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, before that on the President's Council on Bioethics, and as a presidential appointee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. And among his many books and articles, familiar to many of us, is the widely acclaimed 1993 book, Making Men Moral. Welcome, Professor George. Thank you, uh, Professor Moreland, and thank you very much to the Federalist Society for the invitation to moderate uh, this very distinguished uh, panel. Um, I'd like to say a special uh, word of uh, thanks today to Anyone here who is a uh, veteran, uh, we owe the world uh, to you. Thank you for your service. Uh, I also want to say a special word of um, greeting to all my former students that I see uh, out there. It's really great to get to come to a Federalist Society meeting. It's like a family reunion uh, for me. When he uh, found himself in a jail in Birmingham, Alabama, Martin Luther King famously wrote a letter to eight fellow clergymen who had criticized his lawbreaking. It was, after all, lawbreaking that landed him in jail. The eight clergymen were not racists. They were not bad guys. In fact, they were anti-racists in the old-fashioned sense of that term. They were against racism. Uh, one had taken very courageous steps himself with his own congregation to combat racism. But nevertheless, King found himself under criticism from his fellow clergymen, and so he wanted to respond. They wanted to know, how can you, Dr. King, break the law, come down here and break the law, when you yourself advocated respect for law, especially when it came to the enforcement of the Brown against Board of Education's desegregation decision. So King wrote his response. And the central point in that response is that there are two types of law, or what we would today call two, two types of positive law, just and unjust. And so King then asks, what's the difference between the two? Just law has to be obeyed no matter what, even if you don't like it, even if you would have made the law differently. If it's not unjust, you're under a moral as well as legal obligation to obey it. Unjust law, you're not under an obligation to obey. In fact, he goes so far as to say, you're under an obligation to disobey unjust law. Now, how do you tell the difference between the two? King says, just law is law that is in line with natural law and the law of God. Just law upholds, elevates the human personality, or in what in other contexts he calls the human spirit, while unjust law diminishes it. King here in appealing not simply as a clergyman to the law of God, but to the natural law, is himself in line with a great tradition going all the way back to antiquity. The Christian tradition did not invent, nor did the Jewish tradition invent, the concept of natural law. The moral law 
binding as such on all of us insofar as it can be known by reason. The roots of natural law thinking are in figures like Plato and Aristotle, Cicero. Now, of course, the medievals, especially the great medieval Christian theologian Thomas Aquinas, take the ball from the ancients and run with it, develop the theory of natural law. But Christianity did not invent it, nor is it, strictly speaking, a religious theory. It's a theory about what can be known by reason. And it's a theory that's directly applicable not only to our personal conduct, as King points out, but also to the conduct of institutions, including political institutions. It's the obligation of government to make laws that are in line with the natural law. It's a violation of that obligation when government fails to make law or makes law that violates natural law. And it's not simply the ancients and the medievals. The American founders themselves and their great successor, Abraham Lincoln, were clearly people who believed in natural law and in rights that we have, human beings have, not as matters of mere convention, but as matters of natural law, natural rights. Anyone who knows anything about the American founding understands that the American founders sought to create a constitutional order and a body of law that was in line with, reflected the natural law. But we are here to debate a question that has been pressed by Professor Hadley Arcus throughout his distinguished career as a legal and political philosopher, and most recently in his book, Mere Natural Law about the applicability of natural law to contemporary problems, especially as they present themselves in courtrooms, in litigation, and most especially in constitutional litigation. What follows from the fact, the agreed upon, or mainly agreed upon fact, that the American founders sought in the Constitution and laws to embody principles of natural law? What, does, what follows from that? for the constitutional interpreter, and most especially for the judge doing constitutional interpretation or legal interpretation more broadly? That is the question. And to discuss it, we have an all-star panel. I will introduce our speakers in reverse order. Professor Randy Barnett is Patrick Hotung Professor of Constitutional Law at Georgetown Law School and Faculty Director of Georgetown's Center for the Constitution. He is also a prominent and widely admired public intellectual who has helped to shape discussions outside as well as inside the legal academy on questions of civil liberties and the scope and limits of governmental powers. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy from Northwestern University and his JD from Harvard Law School. He's been a prosecuting attorney as well as an appellate advocate and he has been a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and a Bradley Prize. The Honorable Edith Jones has served for 38 years on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, having been nominated by President Reagan. From 2005 to 2011, she was chief judge. She earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from Cornell University and her JD from the University of Texas Law School. A native Texan, she was the first female partner at the firm then known as Andrews and Kurth in Houston. She is president of an inn of court in Houston and on the board of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. She has been married for 50 years to my friend Sherwood Woody Jones and is the mother of one surviving son and the self-described proud grandmother of three beautiful granddaughters. And then the founder of today's feast, Professor Hadley Arcus. He is the Edward Ney Professor of Jurisprudence Emeritus at Amherst College, where he has been the beloved mentor of generations of students, many of whom are here. He is the author of eight books, by my count, including First Things, and most recently, the volume we are here to consider, Mere Natural Law. He's the founder and co-director of the James Wilson Institute on Natural Rights in the American Founding. Professor Arcus, Arcus earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Illinois and his PhD from the University of Chicago, 
where he studied with Leo Strauss, among other luminaries. On a personal note, I will say that Hadley is one of my oldest and dearest friends in academic life and was a generous mentor to me when I was an assistant professor at Princeton, trying to make my way as a conservative scholar in what was by then already hostile territory for dissenters from progressive orthodoxy. And so I am eternally grateful to Hadley for that support and counsel. And it's a great pleasure to turn him over to you, Hadley. Oh. Thanks, Robbie. As the late Dean Martin used to say, what are all these people doing in my bedroom? <laughs> Is this for natural law that they came out? Are we having a raffle or something here today? <laughs> I want to thank Jerry Bradley for, for, for proposing this panel, for Gene Meyer and, and Dean Reuter who made it happen, and, and for Edith and Randy and Robbie who are so kind to agree to come here today to, to join me in this. Tom Stoppard did a play called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern is Dead, and a friend said, what is this about? He says, it's about to make me a lot of money. <laughs> well, I hope this book is about to make Tom Spence a lot of money for having the, the kindness to grab it after three, uh, three hours after I showed him a few chapters. But I, before anything else, I want to move to Cut Off at the Pass, one of the most common cliches triggered by the mention of natural law. My dear friend Russ Hittinger used to say that Abraham Lincoln could not have raised his hand on March 4th, 1861 and taken an oath to defend this Constitution if it were thought that the constitutional right articulated in the Dred Scott case was now part of that Constitution as though woven into the text itself. Lincoln had led a national movement to counter and overturn that decision. Now, since my book, First Things, years ago, I have aligned myself with the Lincolnian position here. If the court declares Dred Scott to be a slave, we will not form a mob to free him. We respect the outcome of the case in regard to those two litigants. But if we're not persuaded about the rightness of the principle, the political branches are not obliged to act upon that principle for the measures that come under their hands. And the Lincoln administration moved right away to reach decisions that rejected the holding in the Dred Scott case. They reversed the decisions that blacks could not be citizens of the United States and therefore not carry passports to study abroad or not claim patents under the laws of the United States. And the Lincoln administration and Congress in June 1862 passed a law to bar slavery from the Western territories of the United States, anything in the Dred Scott decision notwithstanding. In the mid-80s, a question arose in the National Institute of Health, and whether it was necessary, or they were obliged to use tissues in research drawn from elective abortions. Uh, I was part of the crew at the time arguing that if Lincoln was right, it was open to the Reagan administration to say, we respect the outcome of the case, but we never accepted the principle articulated in that case. And so in our judgment, those are tissues drawn from wrongful surgeries. We said that could be wrong only if Lincoln was wrong. We didn't see any way under the logic of this Constitution that Lincoln could have been wrong. Randy, rolling out quotations from the new book, cited my line that the function of securing natural rights was not assigned distinctly to the judicial branch. The dominating purpose or telos of protecting natural rights affected every branch of the government, the executive and the legislature, no less than the judiciary. My point is that this teaching on natural law is not a doctrine to give unconstrained discretion to an expansive judiciary. The argument, rather, is that the judges who absorb this understanding of natural law will have a sharper understanding of the boundaries that mark the limits to the inventiveness and reach of judges. I had the chance to voice this argument a while back the hearings of the Judiciary Committee for our Born Alive Act to protect the, the, the children who survive abortions, my old antagonist, Jerry Nadler, sort of twit me and say, no, oh, Professor, yeah, we ought to try revising another decision. How about that decision of Bush, Bush versus Gore? I said, Congressman, you really should try to handle that to get practice. But remember, you just have to respect the outcome in regard to those two litigants. 
Now, I've been doing round-the-clock interviews on the book and podcasts. At times, it's been rather like Brian Lamb saying, would you talk, remind our audience who exactly was Lincoln? <laughs> and I've had people ask me earnestly, uh, could you tell the audience what is natural law? And I say, yeah, I draw, I draw on Aquinas and Kant to say it's the law that underlies all the laws. The laws will tell us why we're justified in having positive laws. We see the sign saying 65 MPH, 35 MPH. But Kant would tell us behind those laws is an underlying natural law that would tell us why we'd be justified in restraining the freedom of people to speed, to re speed at, has at, drive at has speeds that put innocent life at hazard. And of course, as ever, the, the, the task is to make a translation between the underlying natural law to apply it to the circumstances and terrain before us in positive law. 65 in the open highway, 35 in the winding roads. But at the same time, that natural law also tells, goes back a step further to tell us who has that, the authority to make that positive law in the first place. I was at a stage years ago with that professor from Notre Dame, Amy Coney Barrett, and uh, some, stu there, some students ask, well, why do you have such reverence for the positive law? Why does the positive law in America stand on a higher plane than the law in Stalin's Russia? She's a little taken aback by the question, but the answer was really in, the key was in the string of three questions from John Locke. He said, what is the source of the law? The legislature, which tells us whether we, who make it, is what the law is. Well, then what is the source of the legislature? A constitution that tells us whether we have a legislature, many chambers, what powers. But then Locke asks, then what is the source of the constitution? It must be, he said, something wholly antecedent to the positive law. In our case, it sounded like this. No man is by nature the rule of other men, the way that men are by nature the rule of horses and cows. Any rightful government over human beings depends on the consent of the governed, to which one of my beloved judicial friends said, that's a lovely sentiment, but it's never been enacted in our laws. And the response is, of course it couldn't be enacted. It is the point or the truth that had to be grasped before we knew who had the authority to enact anything in the first place. And that brings me back to this project. We're drawn back to the principles that were there before the Constitution, the principles that the framers drew upon in devising the Constitution. As Lincoln and my friend George Sutherland reminded us, the Union is older than the Constitution. The Union was made for a more perfect, the Constitution was made for a more perfect Union. And as the founders understood those principles of the Constitution, the principles of the regime, were there before the Constitution, and they would be there even if there were no Constitution. Just as John Quincy Adams said, that reminds us that the that right to petition the government was simply implicit in the idea of a free society. You'd be there even if it weren't in the First Amendment. You'd be there even if there were no First Amendment. You'd be there even if there were no Constitution. This is Greg Katz. Greg Katz, on the first day of oral argument over the Obamacare case, cited John uh, Marshall in the old Dartmouth College case, saying, to impose upon people a contract they did not wish could be as bad as impairing the obligation of a contract they had willingly made. And Justice Story would later say, that would be true even if there were no Constitution. Okay. So, the Constitution matters, of course, though. I do want to know whether a state can make its a territory available as a naval and military base for another power. I do want to know that, that every two or four years there will be an election in this country in peace and war. They can't be called off. But I'm offering an originalism that encompasses the founders' understanding of the anchoring grounds on what they were doing and if we respect the Constitution, I'm saying we should come to respect again the furnishings of mind of the men who made it. So I want to go back then to the principles there were before the Constitution. A president of Amherst College once said, Hadley has a theory of natural law. And I said, when you say that, you rather suggest you're standing back in wholesome detachment, watching theories with past, and some are able to form judgments 
about the strands of those theories that are plausible or implausible, true or false. And I said, take me back to the ground on which you're making those judgments about the things you reliably know, and you back to the ground that some of us take to be the ground of the natural law. My dear late friend, Dan Robinson, who author of 18 books, spent his last years lecturing at Oxford, said he wanted, as a line on his tombstone, he died without a theory. <laughs> without a theory. He was really calling upon Thomas Reed, the great 18th and 19th century philosopher, read closely by John Adams and James Wilson. Reed was teaching about those precepts of common sense that the ordinary man not only knows, but has to assume in getting on with the business of life. And so before the average man would start bantering with David Hume about the meaning of causation, he knew his own active powers to cause his own acts to happen. And that is how Wilson incited Reed in the opening lines, the opening lines of the very first case cited in the, U the, U the Supreme Court reports Chisholm versus Georgia, 1793, evoking Reed. The leading fingers among the founders, men like Wilson, Al Hamilton, Wilson, Marshall, showed a remarkable knack of tracing their judgments back to those anchoring axioms of common sense that had to be in place for the sake of explaining the grounds of their own judgments. There was Marshall's elegant opinion in Fletcher versus Peck, but the clearest and most elegant example was that introduction that Alexander Hamilton struck off to the Federalist 31. The papers on taxation, he reached no conclusion different from what Chuck Schumer or Mitch McConnell would reach. But anyone looking at the text would notice some different furnishings of mind. This is how he put it. He said, in dispositions of every kind, there are certain primary truths, our first principles, upon which all subsequent reasonings must depend. These contain, he said, an internal evidence, which antecedent to all reflection or combination, command the ascent of the mind. Of this nature are those maxims of geometry, that two lines cannot enclose a space, two things equal to the third must be equal to one another, and of like nature must be those maxims of ethics and politics that cannot be an effect without a cause. The means must be commensurate with the end, and there ought to be no limitation placed on a power destined to affect a purpose which is itself incapable of limitation. Just the way Chuck Schumer would have said it, <laughs> I, I, I think. I think if he bends his mind to it. We have no glasses, so I have to look like Marco Rubio. <laughs> Get glasses next time. <laughs> but what were those critical things that one grasped in this way, as Hamilton said, per se? No, well, one was the anchoring axiom of the laws of reason. Two contradictory propositions both cannot be true. The average man knows when he's hearing conflicting stories. But the other one, running even deeper, is the proposition that Reed and Kant understood as the very first principle of all legal moral judgment, as Kant had it, it makes no sense to cast moral judgments of praise or blame on people for acts they were powerless to do. Or as Reed said, to call a person to account to approve or disapprove his conduct that has no power to do good or ill is absurd. No axiom of Euclid appears more evident than this. Now, we may find ourselves deliberate over the question of whether Jones really was under medication incapable of performing his act. These are points that are quite contingent and mandeling variable, but the thing is, the thing to be noticed, the one thing in this mix that is never variable and never contingent is the principle itself. If Jones was incapable of affecting the outcome, he cannot be held blameworthy or responsible. Now that proposition, on holding being blameworthy for acts that were powerless to affect, not only explains the insanity of defense, but if we had time, I'd run, we could draw out from that simple line a string of propositions running through our law. And I think it also works to, in print, to explain the, in print, the principle of racial discrimination as, as Robert Jackson fell into it. When, when people, fall, may, people may fall into the assumption that race exerts a kind of deterministic control over conduct. So if we know someone's race, we know that 
They can reach moral judgments about the goodness or badness of these people we're, we're encountering as though they were governed by forces outside their control. If the court ever really arrived at an explanation of what was in principle wrong with racial discrimination, we wouldn't be bewildered now wondering whether that principle in the racial preferences case goes beyond the colleges to apply to corporations and whether in corporations it goes about employers to apply to, apply to officers. But let me see what I can draw out in one minute from that anchoring point. We don't hold people blaming for acts their powers to affect. We hold people responsible for their own acts and not for what is known in the aggregate of that racial group in which they happen to be members. But as we judge, we insist that people should be punished, as John Stuart uh, Mill said, they should be punished only for wrongdoing. And if we respect the difference between innocence and guilt, that obliges us to use the most demanding methods in assessing guilt, rather than having people run over hot coals or, or be pummeled to, to, to shake their, uh, their memory. But as we take the logic a step further, we arrive at the judgment that anyone accused of a serious crime should have access to the witnesses against him for the sake of rebutting them and rebutting them, arriving at a verdict that is substantively accurate, discriminating between innocence and guilt. In other words, by drawing out the moral logic, we would come to the right of a person to be confronted with the witnesses against him. And my point is, it would be there even if it were not contained in the Sixth Amendment, we remember that the framers did not think of putting it in the original text in the first place, just as they didn't think of putting in presumed innocent to proven guilty. And as we know, James Wilson think they didn't, they didn't, they didn't Wilson think we should put in ex post facto laws. We all know that. It's, quite, it's, it's in the part of the logic of law. Uh, as we draw out these principles, and we, we see how they bear in a very precise and concrete way, and things like the regulation of speech, the dimensions of religious freedom, and such matters of withholding care from a newborn born with spina bifida and Down syndrome. I was there in the court the, the day that Chuck, argue, Chuck, Chuck Cooper argued that case. Uh, this is no mere theory hovering in the sky. It's not a mere theory that people should not be held blamely for acts they were powerless to affect, any more than it's a mere theory the two contradictory propositions both cannot be true, James Wilson understood these were necessary truths. And he thought that any system of law drawn from this cannot merely give us a theory of natural law. It will be giving us the real thing. Now, this jurisprudence I've described finds its ground in real principles, propositions true of necessity. And anyone working with this sense of things knows that the natural law cannot tell us the right price in nature for a pair of pants or a gallon of milk. When judges cultivate this kind of wit, their divide is engaged at once when they encounter policies like wage price controls or rent controls. We think of our dear friend, Janice Rogers Brown, raising the question, why was it wrong for the high-end energy company to market milk at 20 cents less a gallon in Southern California. And why does that state of affairs constitute a, quote, disorderly market condition that the federal government has any interest in reaching? The judges who absorb this understanding of natural law will not presume to tell us just how long of a residence requirement is warranted before a community would be obliged to pay for a publicly funded higher education or for the education of children of illegal immigrants, those are judgments that depend on the wealth and generosity of the community. They should be made only by politicians who have a closer condition, connection to the condition and sentiments of their own community. The standards for those judgments are not contained, not contained in any toolkit available to judges. It was said of Socrates that he brought philosophy down out of the clouds to bear on questions of right and wrong that will arise every day. And I'd say what we're trying to do now is to bring natural law down out of the clouds to show it's not a theory hovering in the sky, but that it supplies the grounds of our most practical judgment at every turn. I used to say that to ask whether a judge can get through the day without relying at every turn and the reasoning of the natural law was rather like asking the question, can I order the coffee without using syntax? 
the judge is reasoning with it at every turn, even when he's unaware that he's using it. The statute bars racial discrimination in certain private businesses, open to transactions with the public. Why do we assume that that law should be applied universally, equally, to anyone who comes with the terms of the statute? That's not Cadi law. Why do we assume that the term should be applied universally to anyone who comes with the statute? That's a distinctly moral logic there. It attaches to anything we've come to regard as law, and who put it there? No clause in the Constitution tells us to do it that way. And our experience has been, as we draw out these implications for judges or lawyers, ordinary folk, what clicks in for them now, that they not only know them, but they have the sense that they've known them all their lives. Mere natural law. Thank you, Professor Arcus. Judge Jones. Well, I'm sort of the uh, I'm sort of the straight man on this panel, uh, the everyman, if you will. I take this from Michael Yeoman's uh, reprinted introduction to Mere Natural Law, which says, "I begin with the observation." The lawyers in general are an anti-philosophical race. <laughs> and indeed, my son, who majored in philosophy under undergrad school and would conduct long arguments with my husband, said to me more than once, Mom, you're not philosophical. And I, and I plead guilty. I'm not. I'm the everyman who read Mere Natural Law. And it's like... Uh, some of the issues that have been clarified recently in our political debate, it's something that you realize has to be part of what is going on in the law. And I will try to explain uh, rather briefly uh, three things. Why are we at a moment where we need to think about the natural law in regard to our daily uh, tasks? Um, uh, what is the natural law? and how do judges, how should judges perhaps approach it? Um, why should we look at natural law at this point in our history? Well, we seem to be at an inflection point with the recent demonstrations across the country. Uh, when I was in college, I was there at the worst of the anti-war era. There were demonstrations. Cornell, where I went to school, was one of the worst. School was torn apart, but what were the demonstrators looking for? Uh, as Justice Thomas has said, they were looking for peace. Now, it might be peace, meaning that the Viet Cong were going to overrun and commit the rest of Vietnam to uh, communism, but they weren't asking for the Viet Cong to go set people's houses afire, to burn them alive, to uh, open up the wombs of women with babies in them and kill both of them, to rape, to uh, behead babies, to leave trails of blood. But that's what we've seen that Hamas did. Uh, one, the natural, we naturally want to draw back from the scenes of these, this absolute barbarity and uh, brutality that has been unknown since the gas chambers of World War II but we can't do it. Uh, but here you've got uh, what looks like hundreds of thousands of young people, many of them in college, who can't seem to see the distinction between political debate on the one hand and uh, approving uh, murderous barbarity on the other. So we, we, there is something wrong, some great moral confusion going on. I would add that the preface to today's moral confusion was set only three years ago in the Black Lives Matter riots where arson, assault, um, uh, vandalism became routine with very little response to maintain civil order. Again, it's one thing to voice your disagreements with criminal procedure or how that uh, is worked out in particular groups in society. It's quite another to say it's okay to burn down the immigrants' little stores all over Minneapolis and many other places in this country. Moral confusion. 
How has the legal uh, community reacted to this? Well, I'm very happy to see that the law firms wrote to a number of the uh, uh, famous schools in this country and said, we're not gonna hire your graduates who signed on to these letters condemning the Hamas violence. Well, that's a start. Uh, as Hadley said earlier today, that really doesn't catch the nub of the problem, which is that what they are advocating is terrible violence, and it's up to the schools who are training these people to give them a moral grounding. Well, that's just as true in undergrad as law school, because we all know, certainly going back to my era, but for at least 40 or 50 years before that, the uh, trend in the law schools has been to divorce morality, con concepts of justice, natural justice, from the law. They thought that was a product of medieval thinking, uh, that the trend of the times was historical, that progress meant that everything trended upward in society if you just had the right government and the right economics and so on. Um, obviously, that's not right. And we are at a very, very serious point in our society when we have one group of, of people in our society essentially calling for the annihilation of another group. That's, that's you know, certainly not it, part of America in the last century. So what is what, let's think about natural law, or I think I, think I should, we should think about what it is that orders men's lives, that orders society's life uh, to avoid the kinds of crises that we are seeing and God forbid that we hope we will not enter into. The, um, the uh, what is natural law? Hadley was uh, explaining, and, and these gentlemen can explain this in a much more detailed and systematic way than I can, but at least I read the book and the point, what, what Michael Yulman also points out in the introduction is that not, the lawyers can be trained to think in the way of natural law and justice. It's just not done at the present time. And of course, I might add, that was the influence of Holmes, who was great at aphorisms. Uh, from the technical standpoint, maybe not so great but aphorisms win the day, and, and he was very much opposed to uh, any kind of moral conception in the law, and in fact, Justice Scalia even quoted that occasionally. But um, as Hadley writes in his book, and there are a lot of jokes in here, you will laugh when you read great parts of it. He says, the seven-year-old who gets beat up by bigger boys comes home and says, that was wrong. And what would Holmes' response be to that? Well, I mean, if there is no right and wrong, they had a right to beat him up and to take control over him. Well, what does the Declaration of Independence say? All men are created equal. No man has a right to rule over the other. It's a fundamental of political philosophy, that the, or at least in the Western tradition, that the strong do not have the right to govern others just because they're strong. That's a principle of natural law. Holmes was wrong. Seven-year-old boy happens to know that. So let's think a little more about some of these things. As Mike Gilman says, the best way to train lawyers is sort of by analogy and syllogism. Uh, and I agree with that, and that's the way I approached a great deal of the book. Take one example. Hadley goes into many different aspects of con law. He talks a lot about the Dobbs case. He talks a lot about transgenderism. Those are things that are likely to come before our court, so I can't discuss those. But let's talk about speech. Uh, we've, we have uh, a series of Supreme Court decisions in free speech. Uh, he, he cites the Terminiello case from the late 40s or early 50s uh, that have traced an interesting devolution from what the founders would have recognized as speech. Uh, you went from Terminiello, where this uh, inflammatory speaker in Chicago uh, had a riot going on outside because he was so inflammatory. And then he started re throwing rhetorical bricks or, or flames on the, uh, what do you call it, 
cinders on the fire himself, and the police finally arrested and charged him. And uh, his conviction was overturned by the Supreme Court in one of the early uh, uh, decisions that said, you know, we can't, we can't uh, vouch for the goodness of the speech or the badness of the speech. They overturned it on jury instructions, and Justice Jackson recently returned from Nuremberg, was shocked. He was one of the, dis the only dissenter. He said, this, the Constitution is not a suicide pact. Well, uh, other members of the Supreme Court didn't, didn't draw that lesson. So we then have in the early 60s, Cohen v. California, where the fellow is uh, wearing the jacket that says F the draft into the courthouse, Supreme Court, says one man's lyric is another man's uh, profanity, something like that. Vulgarity. Vulgarity, well, obvious. And it was uh, really, if you think about it, a, a very um, shallow statement to be in a Supreme Court legal opinion. But I would take the position, and I drew this conclusion even before I read Hadley's book, that when you become too open-ended about the uh, freedom of speech, as we see from the series of Supreme Court decisions, what you end up with is an abundant, no, no more civil discourse. I mean, if you can say F the draft or wear it in the courtroom, the next case they had was a fellow who was spouting the F word in a school board meeting, the Rosenberg case, and then you have you take, you know, it's systematically gone downhill from that to the Westboro Baptists, where Justice Salito alone, I think, was the dissenter when they were screaming profanities at, as the family tried to bury their uh, son who had been killed in combat in Iraq. Uh, you know, in old days, that would have been considered an assault. Um, it would have been an intentional tort, infliction of emotional distress, and the Supreme Court saw that as protected by the First Amendment. You go then down to the Stolen Valor case, to the Mattel case, where um, uh, that was the slant uh, that was kind of refused to trademark, and the Supreme Court, uh, apparently they all knew that if you can trademark something like that, you can trademark any kind of vulgarity, so again, when you destroy reasoned speech, you destroy the possibility of civil discourse. So you have to ask, is a constitution a suicide pact? Is there a way to limit speech in a reasonable way? Um, and you know, one of the hallmarks that the, one of the grounds that the Supreme Court saw a long time ago to try to curb these tendencies was called fighting words. And, you know, it is possible, I'm not opining on it, but it is possible that many of the de demonstrations that are going on today are fighting words. They're deliberately inciting anti-Semitic violence uh, in a way that we've never seen before. And in fact, I would commend to you the president of Tulane University, which has a large Jewish population, uh, where they were demonstrating in support of Israel last week, and the pro-Palestinians came up to disrupt it, and fisticuffs broke out. They arrested the malefactors. Uh, the president said, we're not through arresting because we haven't finished looking at the video yet. And then he said, whoever is charged with anything in regard to this uh, uh, by the law is going to be expelled. So was that an abrogation, abdication of free speech? Uh, one other area I'd mention is uh, uh, defamation, New York Times v. Sullivan, for the sake of time, I'll just comment. I've, won I've long wondered whether that was a uh, reasonable opinion. After all, uh, it was uh, Shakespeare that wrote, he who steals my purse steals trash. He who, I wrote it down here somewhere, uh, robs me of my good name, gains nothing but, but basically uh, Dis, uh, destroys me. Um, New York Times v. Sullivan allows uh, 
the press to uh, utter the most grave falsehoods uh, about anybody with, with very little recourse. Um, and again, it destroys the possibility of, uh, it, it certainly has created incentives against truth telling in the news. So what is natural law? What do you do with this? Uh, he, Hadley talks about these anchoring principles that underlie all of the thinking that we have, and he's described a couple of them here. A lot of them were voiced by Lincoln in practically all his writings, famously described in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, uh, his, where the issue was, is, is a slave a man? Is if a man, why isn't, why, what gives anyone the authority to rule over that man? Uh, that's a principle embedded in our government, embeddable, embedded in fundamental natural law, and applicable to many uh, subsequent types of positive law through the years. Uh, natural law is not something that exists in the clouds, despite the derision of Oliver Wendell Holmes. Uh, it traces the, uh, its origin back thousands of years, as Professor George noted. Um, it is present in the opinions, and I, I checked out Hadley's sites here. I went back to Fletcher versus Peck, uh, uh, Chisholm versus Georgia. Of course, all American lawyers were trained on Blackstone for well over 100 years, who starts off describing natural law and how it uh, is the presupposition of all of our constitutional and positive law. Uh, Justice Story drew from natural law principles for an opinion he wrote on circuit called uh, La Gine, Eugenie, excuse my French pronunciation, where he said that slavery was abhorrent as a matter of natural law and therefore the slave trade could be condemned under principles of natural law and principles of the, uh, of, of the law of nations at that time and therefore a vessel engaged in the slave trade was subject to be um, attached, li libeled, and taken away from its owner. Um, when Hadley is, some of the precise principles that he refers to, principle of contradiction, which uh, I mentioned already, the idea that no person is responsible for uh, things that he cannot control, that is the root principle of no discrimination on the basis of skin color. Uh, Aristotle's was do good and avoid evil. Uh, in many uh, notions of positive lawmaking and judicial lawmaking, we have to make prudential judgments about n uh, doing good and not doing evil, but the, that's, the, that's the fundament from which we operate. Um, I will add one about property that um, agreements voluntarily entered into must be fulfilled. That's the root of our contract law. Um, so this, uh, there have been criticisms of Hadley's book. Let me make a few responses to those by very, again, uh, scholars much more learned than I am, but I think they were uh, misapprehending what he is saying. Some couple of scholars have said that he's trying to take us back to the idea of uh, judge-made law. That is not so. He, is, he calls himself an original originalist because he's trying to recover the sense that was Im immanent in what the fun, uh, founders were doing that um, there are these principles that exist beyond the Constitution. Does that mean that we decide cases beyond the Constitution? Not necessarily, in fact, almost never, because the Constitution itself, as Scalia and others well know, creates a structure of government that itself is based to reflect the moral and uh, natural law. But there are, there are questions posed under the Constitution like free speech, like the scope of religious liberty, 
like the fundamental issues about a child in the womb and what are male and female that the Constitution doesn't answer, but right reason uh, for many of us forms the right answer. Um, he calls, he, he criticizes opinions that have been issued by a number of members of the Supreme Court who are conservative originalists. Does that make him not an originalist? No, it does not. Conservatives love to disagree with each other, don't we? Uh, <laughs> Uh, there are many ways to have disagreements and to think about things in a different way. Uh, one can realize, again, going back to the speech cases I talked about, uh, you, you know, do you, really, do you really mean to say that the law in Chicago that, that was curtailing loitering in order to stop drug dealers from monopolizing all the streets in South Chicago was unconstitutionally vague. That's what the court held in 1999 in Morales v. Chicago. I will say both Justices Scalia and Thomas dissented in that. But what happened? Well, the drug dealers took over. There was poignant testimony from the local people that they were scared to walk outside for fear of the crossfire. Well, guess what? Chicago hasn't gotten any better for lack of enforcing that. And in fact, the Ninth Circuit, um, having condoned camping in public spaces, we see what's happened to public order and civility in the cities in which that are beleaguered by uh, those kinds of holdings. Are those holdings outside the Constitution, outside the realm of rights? I'll leave it to the Supreme Court to determine, but uh, the the seven-year-old boy probably has an answer to that. Uh, finally, I would um, one of the one of the other arguments: Does this open the door to substantive due process? No, uh, it does not, because these principles have been known for a long time. They just haven't been taught. And it used to be that judges, the lawyers, started out their education with several lectures and training in the natural law, much of which is uh, syllogistic uh, reasoning from first principles, as Yulman said, natural to lawyers. Okay, finally, what can judges, what are judges supposed to do about this? Um, you know, I've just voiced a couple of the areas where I'm particularly sensitive to the need to take an, another look and articulate the underpinnings of our decisions in such a way that they are not morally relativistic. It, it, it's, it's very fine to say, you know, the, the, the originalist view on, uh, we'll, we'll be seeing more of this in the Second Amendment arguments in the, in the near future, so I can't go too far, but if you work your brains a little bit, you will see there are a lot, there's a lot of question and I don't think it was an accident that Justice Thomas specifically referred to analogical and syllogistic reasoning about what should be the proper scope or limitation on Second Amendment rights. Uh, the problem for judges is, I'm certainly not a young judge, uh, there are, but I was not trained in natural law uh, in the way that the founders were. I've, spent some time trying to recover the thinking of the founders for my own self-education, but there is a big educational problem before you can ask judges to incorporate uh, a kind of thinking of right and wrong that used to prevail. So I would say that the next book Had Hadley has to write is a, a version of Scalia's reading law where he sets out, he restored to legal thinking the canons of interpretation. Right. And one of those canons is the necessity for mens rea in criminal law. And Justice Scalia was a big one for saying that he was purely originalist and he couldn't go to that law in the sky. Where did the idea of mens rea come from? Well, it pre-exists the Constitution. In fact, it probably goes back to Genesis. So, uh, and before that, of course, it would have gone back to Aristotle and Cicero. So even those kinds of principles uh, 
go back to a, a way of thinking and a need for stability and moral judgments that we ought to seriously incorporate into the law nowadays. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Jones. Professor Barnett. Well, I want to thank the organizers for including me in this wonderful program. Thank Hadley for his wonderful book. I'm very impressed by the turnout at this program. I thought that when I agreed to be on a natural law program, we we're going to be like 20 people in a room, but uh, this is very nice. So let me, let me start my talk with a hypothetical, or what I wish was a hypothetical. Suppose that the legislature of a hypothetical state, call it California, <laughs> enacted a statute removing your children from your custody whenever an official of the state determined that it would be in the best interests of your children. I'll let you fill in the blanks why the state of California might think that it could raise your kids better than you. Do you have a right to raise your own children? Or more relevantly, under the US Constitution, do you have a constitutional right to raise your own children? After all, while the Constitution protects the rights of speech, press, and assembly, and as well as the right to keep and bear arms, says nothing about a right to raise your own children. So can you assert such a right in court? As it happens, there's a Supreme Court precedent on this question. In the 2000 case of Troxel versus Granville, the court specifically considered whether a mother had a right to raise her own children, and this right superseded, and did this right superseded this right superseded an order by a family court judge supposedly based on the best interest of her children. By a vote of six to three, the court upheld the fundamental right of the mother and vacated the family court judge's order. Speaking for the majority, Justice O'Connor wrote, quote, the liberty interest at issue in this case, the interest of parents in the care, custody, and control of their children is perhaps the oldest of the fundamental liberty interests recognized by this court. And the earliest of the precedents that she cited were Meyer v. Nebraska and Pierce v. Society of Sisters. In light of this excessive precedent, she, con she concluded, quote, it cannot now be doubted that the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment protects the fundamental right of parents to make decisions concerning the care, custody, and control of their children. Now, Justice Scalia dissented in this case. In his opinion, he conceded that the right to raise one's own children was one of the unalienable rights to which the Declaration of Independence refers. And he further conceded that it was also among the rights retained by the people to which the Ninth Amendment refers. But he asserted, nonetheless, that, quote, the Declaration of Independence is not a legal prescription conferring powers upon the courts, and the Constitution's refusal to deny or disparage other rights is far removed from affirming any one of them and even further removed from authorizing judges to identify what they might be and to enforce the judges' list against laws duly enacted by the people. For this reason, he concluded, quote, I do not believe that the power which the Constitution confers upon me as a judge entitles me to deny legal effect to laws that, in my view, infringe upon what is, in my view, that unenumerated right. The right to raise your own children, I want to remind you. Now, Justice Scalia also disparaged the precedents of Meyer v. De Meyer v. Nebraska and Pierce v. Society of Sisters, which he said were the first to protect what he called the substantive constitutional right of parents to direct the upbringing of their children. In both, case, both cases, he said, came from a, quote, an era rich in substantive due process holdings that have since been repudiated. By this, he meant, of course, that they were decided on the same theory as Lochner v. New York. This ambivalence and even hostility towards the constitutional right of parents to raise their own children reveals what might be called the positivist pathology that has always pervaded the conservative legal movement. By this I mean the insistence that only rights specifically stated in the positive law text of the Constitution can provide the basis of a constitutional challenge to a law and also that the textual references to unenumerated natural rights in the Ninth Amendment and in the Fourteenth Amendment are and ought to be non-operative dead letters. Nor is this problem confined to hypotheticals. During COVID, 
the positivist pathology rendered the federal courts completely unavailing to the millions of Americans who were largely confined to their homes, unable to visit their dying loved ones, or even to attend their funerals. Private schools were forbidden from holding classes for young kids who were overwhelmingly unaffected by COVID, lest their example shame the teachers unions whose members preferred to teach from home. Unless you could claim an enumerated right, like the right to freely exercise religion, conservative judges and justices were A-W-O-L. State and federal governments were not held to any burden to present evidence that these restrictions on liberty, these radical, unprecedented restrictions on liberty were truly necessary and proper. This positivist pathology is based on a not unrealistic fear of unelected, unaccountable judges making up a panoply of fake rights that legislatures cannot override, thereby denying what conservatives call the right of the people to govern themselves. This is an understandable concern, but it arises from the modern conception of constitutional rights that's based on a fundamental misreading of our constitutional history. Under the modern conception, a constitutional right is one that trumps or provides definitive and irrefutable objections to legislation. For this reason, preserving democratic self-governance requires that constitutional rights must be strictly limited. So it is convenient to limit constitutional rights to the positive law rights that are specifically enumerated in the text of the Constitution. But even conservative justices have not gone this far. In McDonald versus City of Chicago, a conservative majority upheld the existence of a constitutional right to keep and bear arms against state governments Writing for a four-justice plurality, Justice Alito declined to find that this right was protected by the original meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Instead, he employed the conservative justice's substantive due process implementing doctrine that they had, had articulated in Washington v. Glucksburg, and that is, to be a fundamental constitutional right, a right must be deeply rooted in the nation's tradition and history. And Justice Alito concluded that the right to keep and bear arms was so rooted. Now the good news is that this conservative substantive due process implementing doctrine could pretty easily justify a right of parents to raise their own kids. They could find such a right to be both deeply rooted in the nation's tradition and history and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. The bad news is that this conservative implementing doctrine rests solely on stare decisis rather than on the original meaning of either the due process of law, of the due process of law in the 5th and 14th Amendments or, say, the Privileges or Immunities Clause in the 14th Amendment. There is another way. The solution lies not in abandoning or ignoring the original meaning of the text of the Constitution, but in understanding the natural rights underpinnings of that text. This natural rights underpinnings is acknowledged by the original meaning of the 9th Amendment and the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th, as well as the Due Process Clauses of both the 5th and 14th Amendments. As Evan Burnick and I explain in our book, The Original Meaning of the 14th Amendment, its letter and spirit, the original meaning of due process of law is about ensuring a judicial process before any in individual person may be denied their natural rights to life, liberty, or property. This judicial process is required to ensure first that a person is actually guilty of violating a validly enacted statute. And second, that the statute or legislative act was within the jurisdiction or just powers of a legislature to enact. In other words, due process of law entitles any accused person to a judicial determination that a legislative act was truly a valid law. Now, when it comes to the legislative powers of Congress, most conservatives are quite comfortable with the idea that before a person can be deprived of his life, liberty, or property, due process of law entitles that person to a judicial assessment of whether that statute, being, the statute being enforced, was a necessary and proper exercise of one of Congress's enumerated powers. In this way, in NFIB versus Sebelius, our challenge to Obamacare was both a Commerce Clause challenge and a Fifth Amendment due process of law challenge to a validly enacted statute. The same goes for the states. Under the 14th Amendment's due process clause, a state legislative act 
must be within a proper conception of the police power of states. But here, as our COVID experience revealed, conservative judges, along with their progressive colleagues, are wary of enforcing any limits on that power. Part of this hesitance arises from the assumption that if a natural right retained by the people is found to be fundamental, it requires that any law regulating such a right be strictly scrutinized. But this is not how natural rights were thought to operate before the New Deal and the rise of the preferred freedoms approach of footnote four of US v. Caroline Products. Indeed, it's inconsistent with how the court in Caroline Products described due process of law. In the body of his opinion, not the footnote, but the body of his opinion, Justice Stone affirmed that, quote, a statute would deny due process which precluded the disproof in judicial proceedings of all facts which would show or tend to show that a statute depriving the suitor of his life, liberty, or property had a rational basis. Here the New Deal is reaffirming the traditional rationality and arbitrariness review required by due process of law. What due process of law requires is a realistic or meaningful inquiry into the rational basis of a legislative restriction on liberty, not the unreasonable, unrealistic, conceivable basis sham review adopted by the Warren Court in Williamson v. Lee Optical. I like saying it was a Warren Court opinion. It was a Warren Court opinion. Unless the Constitution provides a rule-like prohibition, the due process of law requires an evidence-based showing that a law restricting our natural rights of life, liberty, or property is not irrational or arbitrary. To protect the natural rights of the people, the conservative legal movement simply has to get past its demonization of Lochner v. New York. Lochner did not find that the liberty of contract was a fundamental right that was protected by strict scrutiny. It was not about requiring any restriction on economic liberty to be narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling state interest. Rather, the majority focused on just one provision of a comprehensive regulation of New York bake shops, the Bake Shop Act, and that was the maximum hours law provision. The majority found the connection between this prohibition and any conceivable health and safety end to be so poorly supported by evidence as to raise the suspicion that the law was a pretext for what the court called other motives. Now perhaps the five justice majority was wrong in its fact-based assessment and Justice Harlan was right in his fact-based dissent. But conservatives need to get over their fealty to Justice Holmes's Lochner dissent in which he adopts a conceivable basis or fact-free approach to the due process of law. And it was noteworthy that in our Rosencrantz debate on Lochner here a few years ago, Akhil Amar declined to defend the reasoning of Holmes's opinion, preferring the much safer route of defending Justice Harlan's fact-based opinion. Which brings me at last to Hadley Arcus's book, Mere Natural Law, <laughs> Originalism and the Anchoring Truths of the Constitution. In his book, Hadley is rightly scathing about Holmes, who he describes as, quote, a man ever more clever than wise. A quote I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow and maybe make my own. <laughs> that, that's it for your, you, Hadley, it's my quote now. That's it? As, Had, as Hadley notes, Holmes has is, Holmes is fam famously observed that the role of the judge was to stand back and let the dominant power have its way. This is might makes right nihilism. Whatever the majority says is law is law because it's the majority. If we hold back from taking that path, Hadley responds, quote, the only alternative is to insist that this exercise of power over other men must take on the discipline of justifying itself. Now Hadley defines to justify as, quote, to show why something is rightful or just. But when we override the freedom of moral agents, people who can deliber deliberate about the things that are good or bad for themselves, can we actually show as a ground of our policy a principle that would be valid and rightful for anyone who came under the commands of this law? Which is to say, we are asking whether there is a moral ground for justification or justification for that law. And if we take that path, we open ourselves to the obligation to treat the matter of justification in the most serious manner. We must insist, Hadley writes, on evidence and reasons tested in the most demanding and principled way. <laughs>
This approach would have come in very handy during COVID to protect the liberties of the American people. The natural law comes into play, Hadley explains, quote, when we test justifications that are offered for restricting the freedoms of the people, whether freedoms grand or small, quote, to insist that those men and women who govern me need to establish the justification for the policies they are making binding on me is the, the most natural response to this exercise of power. And in the same way, the men and women who take seriously the obligation to explain that justification, to assemble evidence and reasons that are compelling, are doing the most natural thing. Without sounding the trumpets or unfurling the banners, they are doing the jurisprudence of natural law. To this, I would add, these men and women are also adhering to the requirements of due process of law. The subtitle of Hadley's book, Originalism and the Anchoring Truths of the Constitution, appears to align him with those like Adrian Vermeule who have rejected originalism from the right. But Hadley's criticisms of Justice Scalia are really criticisms of Scalia's positivism, not his originalism. I think Hadley would agree yeah. that an embrace of natural law does not entail an abandonment of originalism. Of that is the moral and legal duty of constitutional actors to adhere to the original meaning of the text, provided that the substance of that text is consistent with natural law and adequately protective of natural rights. Now, I'm not a latecomer to this game. Some 20 years ago, in my book, Restoring the Lost Constitution, I spent the first 45 pages justifying the binding nature of the original meaning of the Constitution on the grounds of what I called constitutional legitimacy. I maintained that the reason why the original meaning of the Constitution is binding is at least in part because of the substance of what it says. In particular, whether or not that substance, if followed, provides a lawmaking process that assures that the laws being imposed on we the people are binding in conscience, a phrase I quite consciously borrowed from Thomas Aquinas. In 2004, when I was still on the faculty at Boston University, the Cato Institute held a book forum, much like this one. They invited DC Circuit Judge David Santel to provide some critical commentary. He began his comments by advising readers, quote, to skip that first 45 pages and jump directly to the meat. <laughs> the legitimacy of the Constitution, Judge Santel said, quote, rests upon the consent of the governed. Why? Because, quote, Without government, life would be nasty, brutish, and short, unquote. In other words, the same Hobbesian nihilist might makes right approach of Holmes. When it came to my contention that to be legitimate, a constitution needed to provide a lawmaking process that ensured that the laws imposed on we the people are necessary to protect the rights of others and do not violate the pre-existing rights of the persons on whom they are being imposed, the good judge dismissed this as, quote, a subjective new standard from a professor from Massachusetts, unquote. <laughs> By invoking the consent of the governed, Judge Santel was, of course, invoking the Declaration of Independence. But he skipped the first part of that phrase, which reads, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And like other conservative positivists, he omitted how that sentence begins. To secure these rights, Governments are instituted among men. Which rights are these? They are the unalienable individual rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These rights are grounded, said our founders, in, quote, the law of nature and of nature's God, unquote. Yes, they were grounded in that mere natural law that Hadley Arcus so impassionately defends in this book, as he has in his previous work. The conservative legal movement needs to heed his admonishments. It needs to repudiate Thomas Hobbes, Rousseau, and Nietzsche, and embrace John Locke, Aristotle, and Aquinas, or what the subtitle of Hadley's wonderful book accurately calls the anchoring truths of the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Barnett. Uh, I'm afraid that the wonderful presentations have more or less exhausted uh, our time. I had hoped uh, for some questions, and Hadley had asked me to offer a few reflections uh, of my own.
Uh, do we have time for a, a, I'll skip my own reflections, but can the organizers tell me whether I can have a couple of minutes for a couple of questions? Yeah, okay, please. Wait, 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 the, yeah. look, look, have one. I just want to, I want to explain what Edith was getting at, the remark about the 70 year olds. The question was posed. Two, two, two responses of the 70 year old who's beaten up and his money is taken. One, do you think he thinks he was wronged, set upon wrongly? Or two, they must have been right, they succeeded. I don't think anyone would take the second one, which is to say you assume the seven-year-olds understood what Rousseau said, that the mere success of people in seizing and holding power over others cannot establish its justification. If you ask Justice Holmes, on what ground does the majority rule the minority, it has the brute power to overpower them. So I was saying that this ordinary seven-year-old knows more than the, the highly learned Justice Holmes. Okay, let me get to other questions. Yes, go ahead. Right. Brian Bishop uh, from Rhode Island. I, I want to align myself quickly with uh, Randy's uh, embrace of uh, uh, bringing Lochner uh, back to, uh, uh, to a, better, uh, a better viewed decision. Uh, but the difficult, I thought when you said the bad news, uh, I thought you were going to point out that in this same tradition uh, uh, or looking at history and tradition that we might also say there was a tradition of privacy you know, in certain relationships, that, that this can be kind of played from both sides of the, uh, uh, of the divide on, on issues. And uh, to me, that, that is something that, uh, in bringing Lochner back, really questions uh, the part of Roe, of course, that I thought was the more dependent on sub substantive due process. Okay, uh, Professor Barnett. I, I will take that as a comment rather than a question. Thank you, okay. Brian. Okay, yeah, uh, let's do one more. Bobby, give me a couple. Give me Nathaniel a couple. Lawson of the Cato Institute. Randy, um, I definitely know from what, what I've done that uh, rights were, that at the time of the founding, rights were less absolute than they are today. On the other hand, how does that fit with the, these rights being inalienable and like the fund, and fundamental things of free speech that, and, or in other rights? Let me hand that one to I, Professor I, I, I didn't quite get the question. Oh, you didn't quite, okay. Yeah, Randy, you want to take oh, that's, I mean, it's yeah. a great question. Um, uh, rights uh, were absolute in the sense that they, inalienable rights can't be taken away from you, but the, the way they function in a constitutional order is simply to put the burden of justification on those who would reasonably regulate it. So the possession of a right bars, uh, you can prohibit any violations of a right, but you can also regulate the exercise of the right so as to protect the rights of others. So regulation is per permissible uh, in a constitutional order, even though these rights remain the possession of the right holder, they can be exercised, they can be regulated the way contract law regulates the making of contracts, but then the burden is simply on the government when they are restricting your rights to justify that as necessary and proper. Which if, if they were actually operating on the empirical facts available to them, they should have no problem showing. Or if, they don't, if they don't have to show it, they don't usually do the investigation. Uh, that prompts me to uh, uh, actually do a commercial, uh, which is that for people who are interested in pursuing those sorts of questions uh, more deeply, on November 30th and December 1st here in uh, Washington at the American Enterprise Institute, there's gonna be a conference uh, marking the 30th anniversary of the publication of my book, Making Men More, which addresses uh, many of these basic natural law uh, questions. And I believe that the conference is uh, open to the public. If it's not, I'm making a big mistake in publicizing it. <laughs> but we will be exploring uh, very deeply many of these same questions. Hadley, you wanted 30 yeah, seconds just, at the just, end. Just a quick, a quick some closing words. Uh, I want to pick up one of the things of Randy's. I think people seem to assume that the decision in Buck versus Bell was one of our worst decisions. And we said, well, what would we use to strike it down? Walt, uh, uh, Bill Pryor used to cite Walter Burns. Walter Burns had a classic case on this, and he, he came to the view, well, he, he cited Corwin saying, we were able to protect this kind of, a, we looked at the, at the background, we have no long anchoring right not to be subjected to eugenic testing or sterilization. It's the due process clause. He finds Corwin saying, yeah, we're, ab we're able to protect these kinds better when we had cases like Lochner, right? And 
so Walter Burns ended by saying this, Buck versus Bill illustrates the need for somebody to perform this, this function. Holmes recognized the correct procedure may be nothing but an empty shell or mask behind which injustice is done. In the end, procedural due process is a substantive right which is denied everyone to whom injustice is done. It seems reasonable to conclude that the extent to which the court probes the record of the case would depend on the substance of the law. Permit me a closing word. I've lost a personal word. I've lost a number of people close to me uh, over the last, last year or so. I began to wonder whether I might see, be here for the release of the book. And I'm, it recalls Tom Stoppard's line in The Invention of Love, what he recalls, he, he, he has the 19-year-old A.E. Hausman at Oxford doing a riff for his sister on God's words to Moses as he's showing him the promised land he'll not enter. And he has God say, I'm giving you all of Gilead and Sedan. I'm giving you all of the land of Naphtali and Judah and Amasa to the utmost sea, but not including Wales, which I'm saving for the Methodists. <laughs> So I'm saying, I'm happy to be alive today, and I'm happy to see so many of the best jurists in the country, Dermot and Jen and so others, whom I'm blessed to have as friends. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all, and we are adjourned.